beautiful building. We moved down to be part of Treasury at 50 Martin Martin Place. And then when customer service was created, we moved back. All of that has taken slightly more than four years. Over that time, I've remained New South Wales government's only ever chief data scientist, which as far as I can tell, makes me the longest serving and one of the best. <laughs> it's been a while since this building too. And over the course of those four years, the Data Analytics Center has tackled some really interesting challenges and also found some really interesting challenges which we didn't expect. The Data Analytics Center is tasked with addressing wicked policy challenges, so problems that are complex, subtle, and ultimately have people's behavior at their heart. Over the four years, we have looked at some really, really interesting things, uh, the three examples, or three examples of which I will go through briefly. We have taken the, the, the position that data is a way of seeing the world. Every data set is incomplete. Every data set is less than 100% accuracy. Every data set has less than full coverage. Every data set contains bias. Just selecting the data set by itself represents a form of bias. But every data set gives you a potential, a potential way of seeing that wicked policy challenge from a different perspective. We also take the approach that science is a way of understanding the world and we deliberately recomplicate problems. When we're thinking about a domestic family violence situation, we're looking at that journey of child, family, household. When we're thinking about educational outcomes, we're thinking about all the different possible effects or interventions or points of contact that we can see that journey of child, family, household through the lens of typically administrative data. When we looked at compulsory third-party insurance and imagined a world where we have autonomous vehicles and we have ride-sharing, we asked ourselves the question, could we understand that journey of someone who's involved in an accident? Can we understand that journey on, of someone on the pathway to recovery? And by recomplicating the problem, by deliberately trying to put our arms around as much of that journey as possible, we have a much better opportunity to think about the types of interventions or the, the set of interventions needed to drive outcomes. And reframing the conversation in terms of outcomes is a, another really important lesson we've learned along the way. Rather than trying to drive a particular individual outcome, we think about the, the concert or the interaction between outcomes in a framework. And it works. We, we have survived to this point. We have made some really interesting uh, mistakes along the way, but we have learnt really quite a lot. And that approach of every data set is useful and every data set comes with all of these imperfections allows us to use some of those really powerful, sophisticated algorithms to try and make sense out of these data and reframe the conversation in terms of outcomes. But I thought I'd start easing you into this by talking about where we're going and just a little bit about the philosophical approach of how we tackle these wicked policy challenges. Over the last couple of months, I've spent time at some international data standards conference, and I know you're excited. There is nothing more fun you can do than going to a data standards conference. One of them was in New Delhi, and the air was absolutely choking with smog. And we're there talking about smart cities, and there are standards groups looking at standards for smart cities, outcomes for smart cities, indicators for smart cities. We're talking about the UN Sustainability Goals 2030 one of which is around smart cities, but it includes things like air quality and escaping from poverty and gender equality and a whole lot of great things about how we'd like the world to be. And we're asking ourselves the question of how do standards help, help us get there? How does data help us get there? And it's remarkable. Every single time we come back to the complexity of these challenges, being able to describe what we're trying to achieve in the context of these are the outcomes, these are the data driven indicators. These are the data sets we'd need to link together in order to try understand those indicators. And these are the ways we'd help to understand those points of friction that stop us getting there. In the context of not just the complexity of a city, but in the context of an aging population, we're all getting older. At the end of my presentation, you will know what I mean. We are all getting older. We're all living longer. You may not want to after this presentation. And the world's population is increasing today 7.6 billion by 2030 when the sustainability goals are being thought about. And certainly within the time frame that we start thinking about planning infrastructure, the world's population is expected to be 8.5 billion people. 
an extra billion people, no more land, no more water, no more natural resources. So when we're thinking about how to understand these outcomes, how would we would drive indicators, it's not just in the context of a better understanding of what's happening now. It's in the context of thinking about how the world might look, at least from major megatrends, societal megatrends, technology megatrends, environmental megatrends, and putting that sort of lens on things as we start to think about what we'll need by 2030, 2040, and 2050. This morning I had a chance to talk with some folks from planning about electricity infrastructure, 2050. 2050 is a long way in the future from a planning perspective and certainly from a government perspective. It's actually only one generation. And thinking about a digitized, hyper-connected world where we're certainly using a lot of artificial intelligence or algorithmic ways of understanding all that data helps us to think about what we need to understand, what we need to monitor, track, and look at major factors for to help us work out where we need to go and are we actually getting there along the way. So during the course of the last four years, we have taken a lot of problems which have been brought to us where people say, we want to understand this problem. And we've said, that's great. We can look at that. But we should look at it in the context of this. And then we'll come back to that proof of concept, that, that thing that you're trying to do where we help to understand that journey of child, family, household, in some cases business, in some cases a fire truck or a bit of infrastructure and how that's used. And depending on the life that we're looking at, when we talk about what we really want to achieve, sometimes it's 30 years out, but often it's 10 or five years out. And we think about how we'll understand when we're getting there and how we'll understand whether or not we are, we are measuring, monitoring and impacting the things that we need to, to drive those outcomes. Now I mentioned that I've been at some standards meetings of late. I will come back to that. The, the data part is the really interesting bit. But the challenge of thinking about that complexity means that there are a whole lot of different issues we need to, to, to bear in mind when we're contemplating that future world where we are literally seeking sustainable intensification, greater urbanization, living longer, more people, and living with a whole lot of new conditions which, which we see as a consequence of, of the world changing. And when we think about what we need to get right, the frameworks we need to put in place, the one that I'm, I'm particularly interested in is the privacy preserving data sharing, which will, I promise you, I'll get back to as the, the focus of what I'm going to talk about today. Because if we don't get the privacy part right, as we link more and more data sets together, in particular, de-identified data sets, we don't get that right, we fall over some pretty big legislative barriers and also some pretty big cultural and normative barriers. But I promised to tell you a little bit about how the DAC's been going. For those of you who were here at the last presentation, which was in 2015, I'm sure you remember it very, very well. There were all of these projects that we started off with. We had, at the very beginning, like all good ideas, we had no budget, no staff, we had no data, we had no data scientists, we had no compute platform, we had 10 problems which were endorsed by New South Wales Cabinet, originally nine, and then given out of home care reform as a 10th. And we had legislation in the works that said that for a cabinet endorsed project, agencies had to share data with the Data Analytics Centre. And we had some interesting times along. One of them that I'll just briefly touch on is procurement. And I've already said data and standards in the same sentence. I'm now saying procurement. Notice one person passed out at the back. Just try to hang on. We were working with the good folks at procurement. Procurement is often seen as a fundamentally important part of government, but also an area where great innovation remains possible, but doesn't happen because of all of the, 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 the appropriate checks and balances associated with probity and associated with just governance. And the governance tends to be quite heavy in the procurement world. We had a conversation with procurement about outcomes. What do we really want to achieve? And when you let the procurement folks go a little bit, what they're trying to achieve is a more effective government, more efficient, take cost out, do things faster, but also more effective. There are also some of those sustainability goals which would be supported by procurement in terms of energy consumption, waste production, 
but it's really challenging to connect that blue sky picture to what you need to know. That's a work in progress, and interestingly, as we moved out of Treasury back to Mikel, the procurement folks have moved into Treasury, and we're now having a lot more conversations with my former boss about the work that we could have done while we were here, except we're over there. This is the way government works. We started with just a data cleansing exercise, and it was a simple proof of concept. And that was, can we treat the procurement spend categorization a little differently? It's the way it used to work is there were three people who every quarter would sit in a dark room and run electronic invoices through the spend queue and run those invoices against approximately a million rules. And then they'd get categorized into 275 different categories. We developed a, an artificially intelligent algorithm, in fact, three different algorithms, ran them in competition with each other, and ultimately came up with a solution working with the folks at procurement to do that whole process in three hours. And since then, they've subsequently accelerated that process. But there were some interesting things that we found. The first was there was no one silver bullet to, in terms of an algorithm. But secondly, we couldn't ever get more than 96% agreement with the old way of doing things. So we trained on a million records. We trained on 5 million records. We trained on 10 million records. New South Wales has a lot of records. It's $30 billion a year spent. But we couldn't ever get the accuracy or the agreement to better than 96%. That was good enough for that process, and it's running now. But we decided to look at that 4% and see where the differences were. And it was really interesting when we saw where the differences were. We thought, maybe this is actually showing that the fundamental taxonomy could do with it an upgrade. It's been built over time. It doesn't necessarily have the granularity and specificity, which you could now expect if you redesign the taxonomy. We also did something interesting, and we took out one category, other and forced categorization and said, let's see what happens when we force those, those, those invoices to be uh, categorized against something other than other. And that was an interesting exercise as well. And that's work that we will go back to, uh, but there was a really, really interesting result, which I'd love to tell you about, but I won't. What we realized was there were a whole lot of things that kind of just fell through the cracks because of the granularity and specificity of this taxonomy. And if we put time and effort into that space, there may well be some, some interesting returns for government. We also realized that there was, even though this was de-identified, we realized we were starting to touch on some personal information in those categories, in that other category. Because very often they were receipts or reimbursements for a range of different sorts of things. So even data that we thought was de-identified had personal information in it. It's an interesting exercise which is ongoing. Another exercise we carried out was to try and understand where to put the next school in New South Wales. And the way the, 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 the Department of Education typically goes about this exercise is to estimate the population based on census, to look at births, deaths, inward migration, outward migration, and then estimate based on population the capacity needed for schools. Now, I've talked about already about outcomes a little bit. And the outcome-focused approach we took in this case was to think about it slightly differently. Rather than knowing what the population was, we thought we'd ask the question, can we know who will turn up seeking enrolment, K through 12? And can we do that per school? And can we understand preference, this school versus that school, and propensity, public versus private? And the approach we took was to use hundreds of different data sets to try and not only understand community composition at an appropriate level of granularity to help understand what the, the composition of the community is, but also that aspect around this school versus that school and public versus private. So we linked hundreds of data sets together and again found some interesting things. The first was that the traditional model or the predictor that education used actually outperformed our three algorithms in some parts of the state. We got what we think are much better results in many parts of the state. In fact, if you look at the map over there, the orange part is where the old system worked better. So not one size fits all. Three different algorithms running in competition against the old algorithm. The old algorithm won in a couple of different parts of New South Wales. We also found that we could actually predict K through 12, but not at a school level. We could predict it at the next level up. 
that's not an SA1 level equivalent, but an SA2 level, because it was actually better at working things out at a cluster level. We didn't have sufficiently accurate or fine-grained data to do it at an individual school level. And we also found that there's a lot more potential in this space if we were prepared to start linking in a lot of other data sets. So we, we looked at non-traditional data sets, but we, there's a whole lot of other data sets which were candidates that we feel might help us move in that direction. The question was, of course, was that good enough or is there more that we could and should do in this space? The project that we have been working on since the outset of the Data Analytics Centre has been out of home care reform. When we came into this space, New South Wales was just going through a reform, a review, uh, the, the TUNE review. 22,000 children in New South Wales in out of home care, all identified at risk of significant harm at Roche, taken from their families, put into some sort of protective environment. It cost the state a billion dollars a year, and the outcomes were certainly not what the state was expecting. So we were asked to build a data asset to help underpin reform, and we ran a process very much along the lines of those other projects where we started talking about outcomes. What are the outcomes that we are looking for? What's a good outcome? What's an adverse outcome? And can we understand that journey of child, family, household through the lens of different government data sets and identify points of friction or major trigger points where it heads towards a certain outcome or away from a certain outcome? Now, this was actually a, a fairly controversial approach when we started it. We linked data from education, justice, family, community services, and health. A 10-year longitudinal data set covering 44,000 children, 22,000 at the time, 44,000 over 10 years, and linked in every related person as described by family and community services, 137,000 related persons, and demonstrated that this was a very powerful tool for understanding an outcome, as an example, how children would exit out of, out of home care, age out to turn 18, adoption, stable placement, return to family. And we could predict within an accuracy of 80 to 90% that most likely outcome. And we learned a lot by doing that. First thing is we shouldn't use the term predict when we're talking about people. We should be talking about identifying most likely outcomes. But we also realized that we had, by linking these data sets together, we had hit a fundamental sensitivity. And that's the concern that even though de-identified, even though linked through the Centre for Health Records linkage, Ministry of Health, that's the gold standard. But by linking so many data sets together, we hit that concern that there must be personally identifiable information in those linked de-identified data sets. There must be. We had some very tough conversations with the Privacy Commissioner who said this project has to stop because surely you have personally identifiable information. And the question was, how do you tell? one way or the other. How do you tell whether or not you're reasonably likely to re-identify an individual? So that led to a, a bigger piece of work. Now that project has continued. That project was re-established under a public interest direction from the current Privacy Commissioner, signed off by Attorney General, signed off by Minister of Health, and has expanded to 30 years of data, more data sets from those first four agencies, but also Department of Transport and Department of Industry and when we, that statement that every data set potentially gives you insight into the, the challenge or the factors of risk associated with those outcomes that you're looking for, going to transport and going to industry helped to bring to light a lot more of the edge effects that we hadn't picked up in the first four data sets. Increasing the number of, of individuals in the data set also helped to avoid that condition where you're on the boundary and your boundary sites are somewhat limited. Every child in out-of-home care, last 30 years, every child identified at risk of significant harm, at risk of harm, identified as vulnerable. So it fully covers the challenge that we're looking at, which is out-of-home care. But it's a very, very powerful data set, linked, de-identified. It contains thousands of variables and unique journeys for every single individual. And again, those sensitivities around what are the consequences of using this data, do you have the expert knowledge to interpret the results? Do you have the skills to analyze? What harms would be created by use of those data-driven insights are actually the concerns that are being raised when it's not privacy. Very often the argument is it's because of the Privacy Act, I can't give you the data, or because of the Privacy Act, 
that you must take these certain precautions. That's the voiced concern. But typically, it's the unvoiced concerns around those sensitivities of data subject, data use, use of insight, who gets to see, what are the harms that are created. Doing this activity, we have been scaling up the approach, but also scaling up some frameworks. There is a, a group now called the Australian Digital and Data Council, ministers from every state and territory. We've come together to agree a number of projects that will work across state commonwealth boundaries or across state-state boundaries. And one of them is building an NDIS data asset, but also acknowledging that whilst we will look at the journey of participants and carers and providers, we'll have the conversation now in terms of outcomes, what are we trying to achieve, but acknowledging a lot of the data doesn't just sit with government, but it's NGOs, it's a range of other organisations. So you expand that network of data sources and the ability to share data assets in a safe way is driving the thinking behind how we would build and use this NDIS data asset. But importantly, we're talking about things in terms of outcomes. There has been a lot of conversation around governments of all different stripes about building trust with the public about government use of data, government use of data-driven insights, government use of data-driven decisions as we start to touch the world of AI. And describing things in terms of outcomes really helps with that conversation and certainly helped with the conversation around building the NDIS data asset. We've agreed to do it. We're now in the process of starting the work to prepare the ground for it. And it has the potential to be really powerful. But again, we are deliberately building the complex journey through as many different data sources as we can to understand what actually happens to people in the system, providers in the system, identify those points of friction to see if we can pull the kinks out through service reform or policy reform, or in some cases, even nudges. And that's an efficiency argument. But the outcomes means that we're starting to talk about effectiveness. Does the system actually do what it's supposed to do? And by updating the data assets, we can see whether or not the set of interventions actually are making the difference, driving the outcomes we're looking for. Acknowledging, acknowledging the fact that every individual's journey is unique. But ultimately the point is to close the loop, to do what any good engineering solution would do. Make sure you're driving in the direction, make sure you understand the direction you're driving, make sure that you've actually got the ability to course correct and make sure that you're constantly improving the system. But the challenge is data sharing. And the challenge of data sharing I mentioned, the voice concern is personal information, but really the major concerns relate to sensitivity. But personal information is where we have legislation. So over the last three years, we've been looking at whether or not we could build a measure of personal information factor. And that measure is based on an understanding of the information content of linked de-identified data sets and how unique the smallest group is in that linked de-identified data set. And over the course of three years, we've tried a lot of different things and we have slowly but surely built up a definition in three different contextual environments, acknowledging that how you use the data, who sees the data, and what other data sets you potentially can bring to bear make all the difference in the world about whether or not someone is reasonably re-identifiable. So we've simplified all of those different environments into three. An environment where we have a closed analytic environment where no more data gets in or out, machines are looking at it, into an environment where people see the data and people see the insights and you through process and different sorts of, of controls can manage who sees the data and who sees the insights. And then the outside world where we really start as open data and we have no control whatsoever over who sees or We've been working through a risk framework called the five safes. ABS really like it. It's something which we've tried to look at the concept of if you've got a really safe person working on a really safe project, you can potentially use really unsafe data in a safe setting and produce potentially unsafe outputs. But then the question is who sees it? But we've been asking the question, can we have a 30% safe person working on a 50% safe project? What do we need to do to the data? We have honestly been trying to do that. Uh, I don't think my hair was this color when I started. I'm sure I, I looked a lot younger as well. But we've been making progress. Every year we put out a technical white paper under the banner of the Australian Computer Society. 
2017 was, we think these are all the dimensions we need to contemplate. 2018 said, well, if we had this personal information factor, this is how we use it. And this year, this is the personal information factor. So that'll come out in December. But we also realized that five safes is nowhere near enough. We need to think about the organization. We need to think about the, uh, the long-term use of the data over its entire life cycle. We need to think about the outcomes. And again, talk about not an individual project, individual analytical thing we do, but why are we doing it and what's the context for that data in terms of that use in terms of outcomes. We need to think about how we're going to use that insight and whether or not it goes into an automated system. We're getting driverless trains, a door sitting there running an algorithm, counting people going through, may be able to make an automated decision to leave the door open for an extra second. But if we did a project on homelessness, there's no way we'd put that result into an algorithm and actually do something with it. So the safe use is actually really important. And that's the fundamental aspect behind the AI summit, which is being held later this month. But ultimately, the, the thing we always tend to avoid, but really need to think of, is what happens when things go wrong? What are the harms that are created? Are those harms reversible or not? Are they reversible with some residual cost? To quantify that, we've also been trying to quantify what do we actually mean by data sharing. From the most restrictive is I'm not going to tell you I've got a data set, and there are data sets like that, to there is a data set, okay, to this is the metadata, here are some data products, aggregated, obfuscated, perturbed, to okay, you can have a copy of the data or you can even change my data. There is no standard for that, believe it or not. And often we get into really complex conversations without knowing exactly what we mean by data sharing. But this is the really big stuff. We have t gone to the international standards community and said, we need a standard for this measure of personal information, an international standard. That was last November. We've made some progress between now and then. And most recently in November, we're still in November, earlier this month, the cybersecurity standards world, those that write the ISO 27000 series, agreed to take the work that we've done with the Australian Computer Society and others and actually write a standard for personal information. So set your watches. Two years from Tuesday, we'll have a standard, maybe something a little earlier. But we've continued to work on those unvoiced concerns. The, the personal information factor has two dimensions to it, risk of identification and the information content in the data set. The sensitivity axis currently has 10 dimensions to it that we're trying to work through. And every time we discuss, we often find another one but 10 is what we're going with for the time being. And the question is, can we quantify what we mean or threshold level set, what we mean by those sensitivities? And we're making some pretty good progress. If we can quantify, then we can start to think about considerations and controls, depending on whether it's high personal information, low sensitivity, <laughs> high personal information and, and high sensitivity, which is what we typically think we've got, uh, high sensitivity, low personal information, or in fact, open data, low personal information, low sensitivity, the sort of stuff we should be thinking about for open data. And we're making some progress. That it's complicated. It turns out that it actually takes some serious considered thought and a whole lot of agreement about what those level setting thresholds are. But we're making progress and we're starting to pilot using synthetic data sets, data sets that we have made up based on statistically similar characteristics to hospital admissions, prisoner admissions. We've also used some interesting US open data, figuring that if we do something terrible with open data from the US, it's a lot harder to take our researchers and extradite them over to, uh, to the US. But we're making some very, very good progress. And now we're beginning to be ready to tackle that next contextual situation. What happens when your safe person is actually an algorithm? What does it mean to be a safe algorithm? What is a safe project for an algorithm? What is safe data for an algorithm? What's a safe setting? And what is a safe output? And that may seem to be a very simple adjustment from person, but every single risk assumption changes when you change person for algorithm. And again, the algorithm may be doing something as simple as watching people go through the door of a driverless train and making a decision to keep the door open for another second. Low context, low consequences of getting it wrong, low harm if you get it wrong. Keeping the door open an extra second when you don't need to is not a bad outcome. But just imagine it closed it 
30 seconds earlier or even 10 seconds earlier. The potential for harm in that situation is real, but then you take it forward and think about an autonomous vehicle that's driving along the road, and you've probably all heard about the, the current ethical dilemma in this space. Family in the car, young woman crossing against the lights, pushing a pram, old lady by the side of the road with a dog. Someone's got to get hurt. If it's up to the algorithm to decide that the response to seeing someone cross the road is to apply the brake or steer into the old lady or hit the young woman crossing the road, we have seriously gone too far in terms of how far we can let the algorithm use that data-informed insight as a data-informed decision. So where we are right at the moment is thinking about where those red lines are, how we contextualize where we should put those red lines, how far from those red lines we should actually be, the impact of things like data quality, the impact of things like bias and data, and the impact of things as such as who gets to use the output. Thank you very much. Um, does anyone have any questions for Ian? Anyone at all? Um, I guess I have, yeah, no, I, I do have one. So I guess at that last point there, so I was thinking about this as you were presenting, um, and you were talking about, you know, do you let the algorithm make those decisions? I guess, you know, if you're not, and you still have people making the decisions, how easy is it to demonstrate that the algorithm has actually done? <laughs> so uh, one of the sensitivities is, around the explainability of the result and the contestability of the result and your uh, right to redress. And <clears throat> as we've been leading up to this AI summit uh, in New South Wales, we this is a government summit, summit for with, with a lot of consultation, but for government use of AI on ourselves and government use of AI to help inform insights and then inform decisions. And that question of, of how far can you go depends very much on these issues such as what harms would be created, what harms are reversible, which one's not reversible, which one's reversible with residual impact. We all know about robo-debt, and that's the example of don't do that. It's been very useful for the Commonwealth to create that example for us. <laughs> there are some visions of the future which are being discussed by the Australian Digital and Data Council, and we will also use those as examples, as case studies in this AI summit because it looks like a wonderful utopian future. Question then is, what are the considerations we need to put in place, such as contestability, such as your ability to redress, your access to redress, and explainability. And it turns out that most of the issues are actually data issues. If you take algorithm out of this concept, then you still wind up with exactly the same problem. And then the question is, we've talked a lot about ethics frameworks and such things, ethics around AI. And in going through the exercise, it will take the algorithm out or, or dumb the algorithm down so it doesn't do much and people provide the processing. You still have exactly the same problems, which is an interesting point of realization. If you then take the data out of that conversation and you still think about the ethics frameworks and you still think about explainability and contestability and so on, you still have exactly the same problem. The difference is that with data and algorithms, we can speed this process up and we can do things much faster, we can do things at bigger scale, so we could get to that harm point much, much earlier, much quicker. But the process is absolutely the same. The explainability of a human decision is really quite challenging. If you challenge someone to explain why they did something at the level of scrutiny you expect from an algorithm, you won't get it. There are guidelines, there are principles, but you won't get it. You can't take the lid off and look inside. Not at the moment, maybe, maybe after the summit we will. No, that's a joke, really, that's a joke. But that explainability doesn't exist. So there are, it, it, really what we're talking about is a more fine-grained way of being able to do the things that, that exist, irrespective of whether it's algorithm or not. Sorry for such a long answer. Uh, no, I think I think that's good because we're, we're all in the business of making sure that records of our decisions are kept. And when it turns out that actually there's nothing really to back those decisions up or any way to look inside of them, are the records that we're keeping worth anything at all? So I think he's, <laughs> with, with one presentation, um, completely um, removed the foundation under which we're working. No, oh, obviously that's it. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. Thank you. So, okay. Um, oh, okay, yes. Uh, so the next person we have.